If I ask you to describe a color to a blind born person, what would you say to describe green? See, I don't think that you actually can say anything about that. Because green and other colors, as many things, do not exist outside your brain. In fact, color is actually a length, a wavelength. See, you see an object based on the light that falls on the object and then gets reflected into your eye. When light falls on the object, some of it gets absorbed and the remaining is reflected to your eye. Light is a bunch of photons and these photons act like a wave. The wavelength of these photons is the color. When these photons reach your retina, your retina gets stimulated according to each wavelength and then transfers electrical stimuli to the brain. Then the brain is the actual organ that gives this color to each wavelength. So in your brain, red is this, but in reality, red is that. So your brain used light to create an image of reality and used your eyes as windows just to get the data, the information about the world as an electrical stimuli into the vision part in the brain. Imagine you were born an echolocating bat. Your brain would then use ultrasound instead of light and your ears would be the window for your brain to create a, a map for the world. And perhaps that's how you would see the reality around you. Black ghost night fish, for example, uses electrical fields to create a vision map around it, not light. And some birds can see the magnetic field of Earth. Same concept applies to your ears. Your ears detect air compression waves and then transforms these waves into electrical impulses and then the brain turns this into what you know as sounds. So the concept is the same. The brain is sitting in that dark room, your skull, and then getting the data in the form of electricity that got transferred through windows. Those windows are your senses, your ears, your eyes, your skin, whatever the sensation is. So the reality around you is the meaning that your brain gives to the electrical patterns coming from your senses. So suppose we create the same pattern without the existence of a stimulus. Will we be able to create a fake reality? That actually happens every day, but I bet you never considered it. When you dream, there is nothing happening around you, but you seem to live in an alter reality that doesn't exist, in fact. And that also happens with drugs that cause hallucinations. So it's actually the brain that sees, not the eyes. Based on that, can we make a blind person see without using his eyes? Okay, let's think about it. We bring a camera and then deliver some electrodes from the camera directly to the brain, to the vision area in the brain. But wait, wait, wait a second. Why do we even need the electrodes? I mean, we still have other senses intact. We have the skin, we have the tongue, we have the ears. Why don't we simply just deliver the electrical signals through those other senses. Okay, so how we go about it? Actually, somebody already thought of that in 1965. Paul Y. Rita created the first sensory substitution device, a dental chair, a dental chair where the patient will sit down and then relax his back and the back of the chair have 
an array of 400 stimulators distributed on the back of the patient when the blind patient or the blind person uh, sees an object the array draws the picture of the object on the back of the patient something that would look like this and then the patient gets trained for long times so that his brain can understand that the data coming from the skin this time is not for touching it's for seeing for vision but i don't think you really appreciate the complexity of vision see look at my face what do you see oh thank you thank you i know very symmetrical thank you but that's not the point what you're actually seeing is a multi-component object you're seeing lines straight lines and curved lines you're also seeing things that are closer to you my nose and things that are a bit further like my eyes and you realize that these things have difference in their distances from your eyes do you, you get the perspective of what is closer to you and what is further from you you might even in other cases see shadows because if you're seeing it now i really need to change my cameraman these are very sophisticated matters for you to understand also you can identify my face without seeing the whole face you can identify it from different angles you don't need to see all the details to know that this is a face this is a huge complexity your brain receives all this data by, by components and then gathers them all into the big picture which is the face imagine you are seeing for the first time in your life and you are getting introduced to these concepts one by one so in this case the patients have to be gradually trained on these new concepts to them these patients were born blind they were they didn't become blind later in life so firstly they get introduced to the concept of lines a straight line a vertical horizontal diagonal lines and then after that uh, combined lines or shapes like circle square and then objects object by object like a phone a horse once they are able to identify all this they get introduced to more complex stuff like a face or a person after the training the patients start to understand the new concepts of having a shadow or identifying an object from different angles or seeing things within perspective realizing their position and realizing whether they are far from them or closer to them and they were able to identify a phone by only seeing a part of it the cord for example at the end they were actually able to perform very complex missions like catching a rolling ball that will fall out of a table on the ground they were able to catch it before it falls this is huge for a blind person it requires hand coordination and you have to be able to realize the position of the ball and the velocity that the ball is rolling with so that you are able to coordinate your hand velocity with the velocity of the ball and catch it successfully and they did it which means they are actually seeing it's not that only they are just identifying objects based on the stimulators in their back they're actually able to detect things in different positions and situations moving or fixed which is great but here comes a very interesting question that i am sure crossed your mind if we are delivering vision data to the brain through other senses say the skin and the skin is delivering the electrical impulses to the brain these impulses are not going to the vision part in the brain they're going to other parts so how come the patients were able to see using data coming from the skin so actually this was the key for a huge neuroscience concept which is called brain plasticity and it basically means as the term might suggest 
that the brain is not a rigid structure. It can change structural organization and change the function of some parts, rewire itself to adapt to new tasks like compensating for sensory loss. Or like learning, for example. When you learn that happens without brain plasticity, it would be really hard to rewire your brain for new tasks like driving, for example. And this concept is what made the brain create a vision map out of non-conventional ways of data. Data coming from the skin and the brain used it to create images. Patients were able to identify the original sensation of the organ, say the skin and the touch, and the new function of the organ, which is here in this example, vision. And it was surprising to everyone. So it appears that the brain can differentiate between the two sensations coming from the same sense. And the activation of the vision parts in the brain happens when you start triggering the skin for seeing, not when you trigger the skin for touch. This created the invention of sensory substitution. When you use a sense to deliver data that are conventionally delivered by another sense. One of the very simple forms of this is braille reading. When blind people use touch to acquire information that are normally acquired by vision. Actually, reading might be a form of sensory substitution. You use your eyes to get information that are normally acquired through hearing. You use your eyes to detect spoken words. This concept made us able to replace lost sensations in multiple ways. Say, when you replace vision with uh, stimulating the skin. Also, another machine replaced vision with stimulating the tongue and it appeared to be more successful. The tongue is easily stimulated, it's really sensitive, more sensitive than the skin. And recently, a scientist from Stanford called David Eagleman started a company that creates sensory substitution for deaf people by replacing the ears with their skin. So they created a vest that the patient or the subject will wear and whenever a word is spoken, the vest triggers a frequency that matches the spoken word around their body, around their skin. And then with training and after multiple days and months of training, they are able to hear the words and describe phrases easily. Based on these concepts, do you think we can just replace the lost sensations or lost senses or we can actually even add new senses to the human race. Hmm, I actually don't know yet if we can, and I haven't read any research about that before, but if you did, please put a comment below and let me know about it. But you might be skeptical and you might hate all this, you hate machines, you don't want anything to do with computers and you don't want to see using machines. Well, I got something for you. What do you think if we can genetically modify blind people to add new receptors to the retina and make them see naturally? We'll leave this to another episode. But for now, don't forget to check the references and I left a very cool talk for David Eagleman uh, in the description below. Make sure to check it out and see you in the next episode.